Hello, everybody. Thank you for sticking around after table takes this morning. Um, we are gathered again for another Gen conversation. Oh, uh, I get it. Where, yep. Just uh, I wanted to subtly slide it through there and see if uh, anybody would notice. And apparently you caught me. Um, we are discussing this week um, how to play RPGs online because in case anybody hasn't noticed, a lot of us are not allowed to leave our houses uh, to travel for non-essential reasons. And instead of debating about whether or not your D&D game is essential, uh, we're just going to discuss maybe how you could take it online. Um, specifically from the perspective of somebody who has not done that before or who is not comfortable having done that before. Um, because like that, that's my current circumstances. I had played a little bit online. It never really quite seemed to click. And now we don't really have a choice. So we've been adapting. Um, so I figured that maybe if we brought in some folks who have a great deal more experience with that, uh, a much higher comfort level, some expertise, perhaps, we could get some key advice that would help other people make that transition a little more smoothly so they can get back to enjoying their games instead of cursing their computers. So we and are joined still by- still asked me, which is- <laughs> well, we have to have what all sides of the debate, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we are joined by Carlos, who is a content creator for Roll Twenty, and then our familiar Christian, who is an actor, co-host for Table Takes, and runs the Zombie Orpheus Entertainment Live Studio. Well, um, I help. Uh, Carlos, anything that you want to say about yourself to kind of introduce yourself to our viewers? Yeah, um, I'm a content creator for uh, Roll Twenty. Uh, I create uh, videos and advertisements. Uh, I do a lot of graphic design. Um, I'm also a brand ambassador as well. So I'll speak on panels and uh, give tutorials and stuff like that. I also run my own uh, Twitch channel as well, uh, also, also called Carlos Crits. You can find me on all social media under that name, uh, where I talk about um, basically anything that you, I'm a full stack creator, right? Full stack developers, I'm a full stack creator. Uh, so I do front and back end creation. So anything in the Adobe suite, uh, I, I talk about Premiere or even lighting, photography, streaming, anything that you want to learn, you can head over to Carlos Crit's uh, uh, Twitch, Twitch page. And you are doing lots of tutorials right now and kind of how-to guides and just general tips. So if people are curious about those things, go check out what you've done recently. I'm yeah. curious. Send me a link. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about you, Christian? Uh, how, how about me? I... Well, I, I any any other things that you want to say to introduce yourselves to our viewers who may not be familiar with your well, uh, I, your passionate table takes persona? <laughs> uh, I am a, if I stream uh, RPGs five days a week generally, and uh, having to switch over to a home studio was uh, a big change for me, and I have been doing it for weeks now, and I still suck at it. Well, hopefully, we will all suck a little bit less. <laughs> after this hour. Um, we do have a couple people, or at least one person in the chat who's asking a question that we'll get to. Um, uh, they want to know um, uh, how to maybe accommodate folks uh, who are blind or who might have other um, kind of accessibility issues in some of these online games. So um, kind of think about that in the back of your mind while we go through some of the basics. And then I'd like to kind of touch on that once we've covered some of the fundamentals and how to get online. So first, um, for each of you, uh, what is the like the the most bare bones basic stuff you need to be able to play a game online comfortably? Internet, uh, <laughs> I guess, <Yep. laughs> or intranet, depending on what side of the office you're on. Uh, I, it's some form of communication, right? So that could be uh, audio, that could be uh, a video in person or just visual, right? Because you can play a game just by looking at screen, looking at uh, your browser. You can play a game, a drawing game or something like that. So bare minimum is just internet in some way to use one of your senses, I guess. Mm -hmm. How about you, Christian? I, I think that uh, having a, a webcam and a decent microphone is pretty much key because there are so many uh vi there are so many audio issues if you don't take care of them well ahead of time that you can run into make sure you can hear everybody from the very beginning so a good yeah, the, a good mic is a must mm -hmm. yeah like the i think the the kind of order of importance i think that i would go probably go with is you know obviously you need internet and audio or at least for this is for most rpgs like i think you know as carlos mentioned there's going to be some games that don't 
strictly need audio. Um, but I think for the purposes of our kind of conversation, we're mostly covering reasonably traditional RPGs, I think. And in those cases, it's the game is kind of a conversation with your friends. So on a most basic level, you do need, you know, internet and you need audio. Um, I personally find video to be very, very helpful in kind of connecting me with the other players who are playing and kind of being aware of their state when they're not talking. Um, but I do know that even some of the people that I've played with, um, I think actually prefer audio only for some reason. Um, I think it might be because, you know, I don't know why. Um, it could be that the uh, a delay between the audio and the video or the choppiness of video or whatever else might cause problems for them. Um, but there's definitely been kind of a division in our, our gaming group where some players will use video, some don't, some pay attention to it, some don't. Um, but, you know, I personally have found that even just having Discord, which is a free app or Google Hangouts or even free Zoom or even Skype, if you really can't find anything else, um, you know, something it. that's pretty, yeah, pretty basic and universal and will get you through it if you, you know, put the time into it and you're willing to kind of spend time with your friends. Yeah, me, I'm always into the, the role playing aspect of things, obviously, coming from that theater background and mm -hmm. being able to see the people that you're talking to makes a huge difference. When we're at the table, I, you know, I like to make eye contact and, you know, people know who I'm addressing because I can look right at them and they can look right at me. Uh, if it's an aside, I have the ability to do an aside. And a lot of that is taken away from you when you uh, when you move things online, like the aside away from the GM is no longer a possibility uh, unless you're just typing messages to each other, which, again, you know, you can do. But uh, I just if you can see each other and hear each other, you're going to have a better gaming experience. And that's just science, you know, that's a, connecting with people. Do we want to kind of take that moment to maybe address the question that chat had about, you know, how to play with somebody who um, might have, um, you know, uh, impaired vision of some kind, whether they're blind or, you know, whether they're not usually able to read text or anything like that on screen. Um, you know, if they, uh, most of the blind people that I know will have computer um, adaptive software that allow them to navigate menus and new stuff. Uh, I had a GM who ran D and D for me uh, many times and he was completely blind and just his computer would read him. Um, the the stats you would need to navigate through stuff um but uh have either of you played with any folks who were blind or deaf or you know had other accessibility issues not virtually okay yeah not virtually i'm trying to think about that right now uh, that is something that like i've taken into account um just as like the difference between uh, when I actually started streaming, I was actually podcasting before I was streaming. And that's something that mm -hmm. I definitely took into account. And it, it's a different type of playing, right? Um, like podcast, like actual play versus like an actual play, like streaming. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like screen readers and stuff like that, like depending on what sites you pick or what, uh, like you may, you may feel like, oh yeah, I got everything covered. I got X, Y, and Z, but you didn't think about that person at the table and um, you know, what, what stuff that they had to do and is like your website compatible with their screen readers or mm -hmm. you know the audio that they have yeah because it is worth noting that um especially right now with the number of teleconferencing programs that are launching um unfortunately kind of support for screen readers is not always a top priority so if you're going to use a new tool it's probably going to behoove you to spend a little bit of extra time if you have players or you want to make sure you can accommodate players that you just talk to them directly and maybe try a call with them through the platform that you want to use to see if whatever they have set up on their computer already uh, will accommodate that. Um, and again, like, you know, like we just discussed, you don't technically need video. So I think a lot of people who are going to do a basic game of D and D, especially if they are relaxed with a group of friends, um, will be able to over, overcome any uh, kind of awkwardness that they might otherwise feel. Audio you might have should to, be fine. Mm -hmm, yep. You might have to explain some things, but chances are if you were playing with somebody who you know had vision issues at a table, you still had to explain things to them already or you had to help accommodate them. Um, so I wouldn't expect it to be substantially different online other than a learning curve on how to adapt the tools. So, I mean, those are the bare bones, right? You need, you know, you need a computer, you need internet and some way to communicate preferably, you know, audio, video. Right. Yeah. So then why don't we enhance Go ahead, your... Carlos. Yeah. Everything yeah. else just enhances your game. Mm -hmm. uh, try to think of it that way. Um, everything else is an add-on. Everything else is a, like, 
you know, a specialty or, you know, an actual like additional to the, the brain of the game. The brain of the game is just internet, we're connected and we need some way to keep track of this world that we're building. That's it. Mm-hmm. And so then why don't, why don't we talk tons about, of tools for that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we talk about, so like maybe taking the next step, maybe talking about some of those enhancements. So, you know, you have a webcam, you have a microphone. Um, what are some of the things that people can do to um, improve their experience or their, the experience they're kind of making for other people? Um, you know, aside from a, kind of a general blanket, um, try to use headphones of some kind, you know, use an external microphone, use an external webcam, if you have those available, because they're probably going to be better than what you have built in. Um, But beyond that, what else can people consider? Like, do we have tips for lighting, um, camera angle framing, uh, anything like that, that we might want to get out there? Yeah, lighting, I I feel like lighting is super important. A lot of people don't think about it because they're showing up uh, on screen and they might not think, oh, I have light, it's working, right? Uh, But depending on how your lighting is working, how how much light you have in the room, uh, your webcam can be working twice as hard. It could be coming out grainy. You could have backlight that's blowing it out. Uh, So being aware of like how much light is actually on you turn on a light, like don't, don't like expect your computer monitor to like be all the light on your face. Uh, try not to put a light in back of you that's shining at your webcam. Again, people are watching you and that that's just like harsh on their eyes, right? Um, but you can make a webcam monitor, a, a webcam look pretty good just with good lighting. Like, I think it's underutilized a lot, especially like with streaming. Yeah, what about you, Christian? Uh, yeah, light, lighting is huge, but I, I think having a, a shared space where you can, where dice rolls can be had, I think is a good way to do it too. Like having a dice app is so. Primo. So a dice app is high on your list to get to. As kind it of it is if feature. it's a, if it's a game where you're rolling dice. Um, yeah. It's not that I don't trust people who are rolling at home, you know. I especially the people I play with, I I trust them to you know not fudge their own rolls. But having that button there to push is really handy. Well, but before we get to that, because I think that's kind of a system specific thing, um, just to talk about some of my experience with the lighting, um, you know, I'm just in my house now, Um, I have a very basic external webcam set on, you know, I just have my AirPods, and I'm using those. And for the most part, that basically works okay. You know, I have to actually pull my curtains, because if I didn't, then there'd be a huge white light here. Uh, And uh, I just went on Amazon, and I bought like, um, a very basic, like $30, um, LED light, and I just have that, you know, on my desk right there. So, you know, I was able able to see just how dramatic a change that was. Um, and I got some just basic tips from a couple of tutorials I found online or review collections I found online. Uh, like in chat, I will post a link to a wire cutter article that was just like tips on how to uh, ace any video conference meeting. Um, and I think, you know, that's perhaps a little more professionally angled, I, I suppose. Um, but a lot of the advice they're going to have in there is shockingly going to work for whatever, however silly your video conference or video meeting topic is, um, whether it's, you know, what your reports are this week at work or, uh, how you're going to go conquer the dungeon, you're still basically just doing a video meeting. So a lot of the same advice is going to apply. Yeah. I literally went over three point lighting in like two days ago, three days ago on the Mm -hmm. Twitch channel that I run. Uh, so if anyone is curious on like how to get lighting like this for super cheap, uh, like I go through it, like you can go to Home Depot and get this can and <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a can light uh, and then like prop it up here in the corner. And then, you know, there like a lot of people, I don't want to get too far in the weed, weeds with this, but like three point lighting, like what actually makes me look really good is the separation between me and the background. You know, well, you have excellent bone structure too, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> That's lighting though. I'm doing rim wrap lighting right now right like this is like you see how you can see the highlight just on my cheek like Rembrandt's like well known for that but it's just like where you place it place your light at a 45 degree angle have a hair light over over your top here I'll check it out guys. and do you want to summarize hair. what what three-point lighting is real quick yeah three-point lighting is just like exactly that three lights so mm-hmm. right now you're looking at three lights in my room there's a uh, there's my key light which is in front of me uh, a lot of people think that like okay well I want to I want to 
I want to light this subject. I want to light myself up. I better put my light uh, right in front of me. Now you can do that. Chances are you'll get all washed out though. Uh, a lot of the lighting that we like grow up with and we know is like uh, <laughs> c cinematic lighting, right? Mm -hmm. So like that's, and it, that's all specific taste that you have, right? Like cinematic lighting, that's what I'm going for here. Uh, so I put my light at a 45 degree angle uh, from my camera. To separate uh, from the, still, hmm? still on the same level though, or above, or it's it's at eye level, kind of like tilt it down a little bit. So right. like right here, there is a light uh, about like that size, um, just like at eye level pointing down, and I'll get a shadow underneath here that'll like give me the shadow underneath my neck that'll sure. separate my head from my neck. Um, to separate me from my background. Uh, instead of having a light that is just on overhead lighting the entire room, I have like literally this light. I'll just show you real quick. Yeah. Like this is a $30 like outdoor light that people put on like their trees and stuff, you know, like to mm -hmm. light their landscaping. Oh, yeah. It's $30. You can control it with an app. Uh, let me get that focus back on me. Yeah. You can control <laughs> it with an app. Uh, it's great. It's thirty dollars. You don't need to buy those one hundred and fifty dollar hue lights and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You can just throw it, throw it back there. So that's lighting my background right now. Uh, and then the the kicker light, the light that like no one ever thinks about, everyone forgets, is a small light over your head to light up your hair to separate you from the background. So right now it looks like I'm a guy in a dark room right now because I'm not separated from the background. But as soon as I do that, I get highlights in my hair on mm -hmm. my shoulders and I'm just like, I'm popping out of the yeah, screen. The difference this, is amazing. Yeah, it, it's really big. And this is like, this would still look, you know, resolution aside, it would look the same as if I had a webcam on as well. Like I'm using a DSLR right now and that's why the background's blurry. But if I had a webcam, this color science would still look exactly the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of what you talked about, I think is you know really key if somebody's going to stream and they want to have a really professional appearance. Yeah. So you don't have to go through all of that if you don't want to for just playing games with your friends. But a couple of those points, specifically like having the light in front of you on your face uh, over you like having some separation is going to make it so much easier um for your friends to kind of follow your video so if there's if follow you in video so you know the if results there's anything... speak for themselves i mean look at yep. him compared to us he looks like a model and we look like garbage <laughs> well the it's world the needs lighting. garbage too so he's the hero <laughs> and we're the sidekicks that are either going to be comic relief or we're going to get killed to motivate Kill the him second reel that's me yeah second so... reel. <laughs> We know our place, uh, but yeah. So, like you know, again, you are very like I think uh, a high end example of that. Yes. Um, yes. But the the kind of tips that you are giving um, can be generally applied even at a very very basic level. Um, like here, I'm gonna probably anger Marcus. I'm gonna turn off the light that I have here just so you can see. Like this oh, is yes. nowhere near as good um, as it was wait. before. Oh uh, wait, I've got it in front of a window. Never mind. <laughs> So, you know, now I'm back to where I was um, and I got this just by $30 and putting the light behind the thing. Um, and, you know, that I, I feel like that's certainly an improvement enough just for playing with friends uh, and for general streams. Yeah. And then sound too, right? Like audio. Audio is so important. Like we can forgive images, right? We can, after a while, your eyes just like forgive imagery and say that's an aesthetic but sound you will never get used to. Like they can drive people like insane with bad sound. Movies so, like, are a perfect example of that. Yeah. Like yeah. you can't you can't watch a movie with bad sound and actually focus on the film. It can't be done. You can't like there's so many bad YouTube videos with good sound that I will watch, but like mm -hmm. if they're reverse where it looks good but it sounds horrible, it's impossible. So like just being conscious of when you're streaming and talking to other people of where your microphone is, like test it out, record it, ask people, right? Like mm -hmm. ask it. Like I have a, a microphone, right? I'm using an external microphone, but I have a microphone right here. And I don't know how many calls I've been on where I just hear people breathing heavy into it, where mm -hmm. it could be fixed if all they did is just move it out just a little bit, you know? So yep. the microphone's not catching their breath. So being That's aware something and conscious, yeah. That's something that comes up a lot for me with video games. You know, I play a lot with people on Xbox Live. Um, everybody has headsets. Uh, and, you know, uh, my advice there is be conscious of it yourself, but also 
um, don't feel awkward telling your friend that like, hey, um, I don't hate you, but you're just you're yeah. breathing on the mic. If you just want to move the microphone a teeny bit, then we wouldn't have this problem. Um, yeah. Like, I think a lot of people are too nervous to kind of bring it up sometimes. For sure. All right. So uh, we were kind of got into this a little bit. Um, Christian was talking about dice rollers. Um, so now that we've covered some of the very basics and a couple tips to improve that process for most people, what are some of the other tools that you have found very useful in playing games online? I imagine dice rollers would be one category. Um, virtual tabletops would be another. Um, do we want to start with dice rollers? Do both of you use dice rollers, for example? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm a brand ambassador for Roll Twenty. I feel like we got everything. Uh, <laughs> but you yeah, do. Like, yeah, <laughs> our dice roller is great. Uh, it has do like a bunch of different functionality. You can like, you know, do macros and like quick shortcuts and everything like that. Even fudge numbers if you need to. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's. I think dice is important. I love seeing dice on 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 screen too. There's just Me something too. about that. Yeah, it's so it like. It doesn't have to be on screen, but when I see it, I feel like, oh yeah, I earned this one. You know, yeah. when I when I'm using it, when I'm using something like Roll Twenty or Fantasy Grounds, uh, mostly yeah. Roll Twenty because Fantasy Grounds is impossible. Uh, I that's the stuff that I focus on because I like the the combat with the map and everything. I feel moves a little bit slower than it would at a regular table, yeah. uh, but it's still it's a nice having a visual tool there. For me, it's really all about that dice roller. And uh, and having access to the character sheets, it's it's kind of funny because I think I might be the opposite to you too, um, in that uh, I very rarely find any value in online dice rollers. I think I do prefer physically rolling the dice. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Partly because you know we you know we talked about this briefly before the stream, but you know I bought some nice dice. I like to use those dice. Uh, but I think I've just with dice rollers, I've run into enough complications. That, this is also my digital curse. Um, nothing seems to work properly, but like we were playing on tabletop simulator and trying to roll percentile dice. And we just, for whatever reason, we couldn't get the dice roller to stop adding the dice together um, oh. instead of like, you know, doing a tens digit and a ones digit. So yeah. like eventually I was just like, I'm just going to roll them physically instead. It's just going to be easier for me. Um, but I did have an interesting kind of revelation, I think, when I was watching some people play a stream of Vampire. And most of the players, I think, were totally new and had never played before. And I'm pretty sure that the GM or the kind of production staff who were familiar with things had loaded everybody's characters into some sort of dice rolling app to um, make things a lot easier. Because it occurs to me that when you're playing with folks who are new to a game in person, then you're able to just kind of lean over and look at their dice and be like, hey, you know, this this means this, especially for like some weirder systems. You know, this means this, you have this success, like you did great or you, you know, whatever else is going to happen. Um, but if you're playing online, you don't necessarily have that option um, unless you're using a dice roller. So, you know, maybe that's just kind of a, maybe like a, a hidden benefit of dice rollers. If some of the players are more familiar and are able to build everything to work for those who are newer. Uh, it can help folks focus on playing their characters and not have to interpret their dice as much. Yeah, and having that linked to your, that dice roller linked to your character sheet where you can actually just like click on one of their stats and it'll roll the dice related to it. That's pretty nice. That's so handy. Yeah, that that is something that like, you know, at the table, you play with someone new and you're like, oh yeah, uh, you're rolling with advantage. You're rolling acrobatics with advantage. So roll 2d20. And they're like, I have no idea what you just said. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, they're like, I don't know what acrobatics advantage. I don't know what a, a what, what a 20 D is like, they're, they're just, they have no idea, but instead on virtual tabletops, you can be like, yeah, click the word acrobatics <laughs> and like <laughs> it rolls it for you. And then you just click the damage like, or yeah, or whatever it is. Like it all shows up in that chat form. So like, that's really easy uh, to do. I, I've actually never done a compare. That's so interesting that we're talking about this because I've never done a comparison of like, uh, I would love to do a back-to-back -back of teaching a new person in person and then teaching mm -hmm. a new person digitally online and see where like, cause I imagine there's, you know, there's, there's pain points in either, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. which one doesn't, like where are the switch offs and the pain points? That seems like a switch off. I'm sure there's gonna be people who are gonna react better one way or the other, um, just cause of their, their own way that they learn how to do things. Um, but it, it, it did strike me just interesting that, um, 
I don't know. I have a feeling that a lot of people would adapt pretty quickly to a digital format as new players, because we're probably used to having the way computers work. Um, yeah. And that gives you a little more comfort in like, okay, I mean, I know how a menu works, so I'll click on the thing and make it happen as opposed to here's your character sheet. Here's a pile of dice. You kind of need to know how these two artifacts uh, interact with each other. Together, yeah. Yeah. So, As we were talking about it, something else that people should be aware of is uh, computer speed, right? Like their internet speed. Uh, ha when you're playing online, uh, a lot of times, like I, 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 I don't know what the statistic is, but it's something like um, most people, most people's broadband are like at 2G. Uh, a lot of people's broadband is a lot faster because they live in bigger cities and stuff like that. But there's a lot of people who live in like rural communities that might not have fast internet connections. So be aware of that when you take your game online uh, that like, yeah, this works great for other, for every, for these people, but it might not work great for you, or you might have to scale certain things down. Certain features might be needed to be scaled down. So you might not have to have, you might have to try to decide like, oh, do we have to, ha should we have the video on? Or is it more important to have 3D dice? You know, maybe we should turn off the 3D feature and just use regular dice, you know? So like keeping that in mind uh, will yeah. definitely help. The Turns out the more privilege you have, the easier it is to play games online. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that could be a applied to just Very about true. anything yeah <laughs> driving clothes <laughs> food <laughs> so aside, breaking the law aside, aside from dice apps um what else what other tools um you know outside of just the raw video and audio um have the two of you found to be particularly helpful in playing games online character creation mm -hmm. uh character creation is something that like I will forget every three months, like every three months I'll sit down with someone. They'll be like, oh yeah, it works like this, this, and this. And I'm like, oh yeah, duh. I know that. Go walk away. I'm going to finish this character. Uh, Carlos, I, I, I played an L5R game in college, an L5R campaign for a long time with a friend who was just like you. Every time we would sit down, he'd be like, how does this system work again? Like, and we'd be like, oh, oh yeah. God, we were here last week, buddy. Yeah, where does this stat come from? It comes from, uh, what's the difference between? It, like, I'll be asking that every single time. Uh, but character creation and, and a lot of these programs have like like quick wizards, you know what I mean? Like we have the character mancer on roll 20, which is great. It's just like a step-by-step -step that like takes me through and I don't have to like remember everything. Um, yeah, I, 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 absolutely that super handy. I used that last week yeah. for the first time. I got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> also with the uh <laughs> the mpc there's a learning too. curve <laughs> there is a learning curve for sure i be. also i love it for mpcs that's the best part someone some a character that you don't want to spend a lot of time on creating you know what i mean that you just like okay this guy they're gonna kill him as soon as they walk through the door like why am i with i still need the stats right like you still need the stats on the guy but you don't want to waste all that time making them you like just be able to click a button you're like oh god thank there you. are oh, yeah, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of NPC generators that you can find online for pretty much any game system yep. you're looking for, uh, and they're great. they're all handy. Yep. Yeah, I, I love character creators and online reference tools, even at the table. Like, I, I'm a huge proponent of D&D mm -hmm. uh, Beyond, um, and we were using it um, at the table where because I was running for kids, especially, and I think it's really helpful. Uh, and you know, all but one of the kids basically had their characters in D&D Beyond. Um, the one who didn't wanted to make his own class, and there was a whole bunch of complicated stuff, so he just did his own thing. Um, but uh, like, I, I love the character creators at the table, and I think that they still provide like a, a huge help when you're playing online, because I think anything that can help keep you focused on playing and not have to worry about anything else uh, is going to be very helpful particularly when you're already having that kind of um, hurdle to get through of the, um, the screens and the, the kind of different format than you're used to playing in. Um, what about virtual tabletops or uh, some other tools? Like I know that's one of the key components to Roll20. Um, you know, how important have you found um, that kind of functionality to be when you're playing online? For me, it depends on the game, 100%. Like if it's a game that you're, you're going to need a map for, and it, I mean, it's, it's great to have that there and still be able to play those kind of games. Uh, but I do err towards the side of theater of the mind for most online interactions right now, uh, mm -hmm. just because that learning curve is a real thing. And I have a, you know, a, 
a problem with technology as it is. So uh, I try and be just more uh, more narrative in my style. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like myself as well, uh, when I do play more tactical, uh, I, I prefer virtual tabletops uh, just because you know, there's a lot more you can tap into by yourself without looking like an idiot in front of everyone else. Uh, <laughs> where, I, where I can like start running the calculations and then running the ruler to like, you know, check this and that. And I can like mm -hmm. double check like, okay, what is this? What does this spell mean? And what does that mean? And how far is it? And, you know, figure out all the math myself. Uh, I like, like when I'm playing more, if you're playing a more of a tactical game, for sure, I hands down, I love virtual tabletop. Um, have either of you had a lot of experience or, or really any experience um, with trying to figure out what benefit either a, a, a shared kind of writing or manipulation space, a virtual tabletop of some kind, provides to games that don't need a battle map? Because um, I think on one end of the spectrum, you might have a game like The Quiet Year. You know, I know a friend of mine in Maryland loves The Quiet Year. Marion, if she's watching, uh, she really loves that game. But it requires, you know, a shared map that everyone can draw on because you'll end up with that at the end. So that, you know, is an obvious use of a virtual tabletop. Um, shared loot bag is another good way to go. Uh, mm -hmm. Just character notes like, oh, yeah, that's what we did last week. Having that blurb mm -hmm. there on a shared space is. I imagine something like Fate or Blades in the Dark, where you might be writing a lot of things on index cards or clocks See, or things and like I've that. Only, I've cool. only played those games online. I've never played like the actual tabletop pen and first invasion of, uh, of Blades well, in the Dark. Well, when you played them then, um, did you use a virtual tabletop or was it just? Yes, okay. yes we used Roll20 so, for that one and it worked out really, really well. And it was the first time I'd ever used Roll20. Great. And Yeah, similarly, like the the less heavy tactical stuff, you know what? it um there are ways to use the virtual tabletop. Like even if you're playing more theater of the mind stuff, what I will do is I'll find the scenery. If I'm game, if I'm going to be the game master, I'll find scenery to put in the background. So it's not necessarily like they're interacting with it, but I'm putting them in the mood and in the style in which mm -hmm. I'm trying to convey. And then everyone's on the same page. Cause that's the hard part, right? Like when we're all in the same space, we're all experiencing the same thing at the same time. But when we're not like you're in, you're in your, your bedroom right now, I'm in my studio right now. It's just like we have totally different vibes going on where we are, but we can share and look at the same imagery or experience the same audio. Uh, some people like uh, uploading like uh, their own background noises and stuff like that to set the mood too. So you don't necessarily have to be like in a tactical thing, like doing the scenery and theater of mine. Like there's all these tools to like help those games too. Yeah, and I think that you can also, even if you're not using a virtual tabletop, um, you can do things like um, sharing a screen um, or having an entirely separate document or something like that. But uh, sharing a screen, I think, it allows some GMs to share images and photos and pictures um, a little more easily than they might even have been able to at the table, where instead of holding up the monster manual and kind of giving everyone story time where they all have to look at the, the page and hope they can see it at the other end of the table, sharing the image you know straight into the virtual tabletop or sharing your screen or dropping the image into a shared text channel or something like that uh, can help get some of those those resources across there is a website called draw.io have you guys heard of this no i believe so yeah it, it allows you to like you know uh create diagrams and flow charts and stuff like that and you know i've seen people use that for gaming and that's awesome because it's like you know you start here and like the flow chart it, it'll come down with an arrow and connect to the next one like if this then that type statements go in there uh it's great for like organizing i don't know specifically what it's been used for but i know it's like using it to build a world world building is great because you could say like okay well here's the problem for this universe and here are the players and here's how all the players connect with each other um i found that uh, pretty useful yeah I've used uh, either that website or a very similar one, I, I'm not sure, um, for Vampire. Because um, one of the key components of Vampire is the social map of the city. You know, who owes who, who, who hates who, who, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, you know, I set up a big map grid myself that way in a flowchart to manage the relationships for the players to fit into so I could kind of run the city around them, basically. Uh, and then that also just becomes a very useful tool for them to navigate because, 
you know, it, there's not a dungeon to explore in the physical sense, but there's a, you know, a dungeon of emotions and, and relationships that they can kind of navigate through. Yeah, I like that. Uh, so what, and any other tools, you know, we've talked about, um, we talked about dice. Um, we've talked about virtual tabletop. I think you touched very briefly on sound effects. So something like Sirenscape um, is par probably a little easier to manipulate in a uh, kind of an online game than it would be in a physical one. Um, but what else? Anything else that we want to call out to people as they're adapting? Just think some journal writing stuff. Um, like, you know, World 20 allows you to write pages and stuff like that. But then there's actual sites that are specific to journal, like World Anvil, mm -hmm. like specific to journal mm -hmm. writing. Or even if you can't afford any of those things, or, you know, I think they both have free accounts, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's still like Google Docs or OneNote or, or stuff like that, mm -hmm. like being able to keep track and share those. I know I'm not one of those players that uh, is constantly taking notes at, at the game, but like, I play with people like that. I love them. Don't they are the best. They are the best people. Every, yes. Of every it's, online game. They are the backbone of every, uh, the unsung heroes of virtual tabletop are journal, like people who write. In yeah. Journals. Especially if you're not playing with them every single week. Like if it's one of those games that only happens once every couple of weeks or once a month or once quarterly, uh, that player is your best friend. Yeah. We do that in our L5R game. Um, Cause I have a long running legend of the five rings game that had to go online. And uh, even before we started, we did use some of those journaling techniques because a lot was happening in the games. Um, the, we have a uh, chronica.ventures, I think is the site that we use. Um, and you know, I, it's a social game again. So I had a million NPCs to kind of share with the players. So there's effectively a database of all the NPCs and their impressions and their history. And one of the players kept tracks of what was happening each session. So we could refer back and like, it, that's all fantastic. and. I think it made the transition to a virtual game much easier for us. Um, I've used Obsidian Portal in the past in kind of a similar way. So there's a lot, of, a lot of tools out there and the online transition might motivate some people to use them if they haven't before. Absolutely. Uh, I had another tool that I, I might have to come back. To. Oh, um, I don't know, I'll have to come back to it. Um, you know, it's not, it's not so much. Oh a tool but like a resource is like you know searching for players like forums and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh finding new people um because you could be you know again like um you, we're quarantined right now we can't go find new people right now you know like like we need to use the internet so like finding people on forums or chat rooms and stuff like that that's a huge resource too mm -hmm. uh you know to find new ideas or just new people to play with for new experiences yeah now that I've popped the cork on playing online and you know, have kind of gotten into the groove of it, uh, I do keep having this urge to reach out to my old gaming group from college, who's now spread back around the country, oh. to kind of reconnect with them and you know revive some some classic games that we played in. Yeah, get the gang back together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then I remember so, how many of the gang were problem players. Like the guys I played back in high school, most of them yeah. I would not play a game with now. Well, I think maybe yeah. we just won't we just won't invite those folks back in. We'll just invite the the folks we remember more fondly. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've talked a lot about some of the tools and some of the hardware and stuff like that, um, or the general approaches, basically. What about the social change of playing a game online versus playing at a table? Because I kind of feel like. A lot of the times when somebody says, I don't play online, um, it's too complicated, it's too difficult, the learning curve is too high, that you know, a lot of times they're not necessarily talking about the actual software. Um, they're kind of just coming up with an excuse for not having to deal with the way that playing a game is just different online. Um, do you have any kind of tips, advice on either things that you need to learn how to do or things that you need to remember to not do? For me, there's one super important piece of advice, uh, and, and that is be a better listener than you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Because crosstalk is a problem at any table, but when the voices jumble together and you can't see who's saying what, uh, it makes, it's, it's awful. So really, really be a better listener. Uh, watch the crosstalk. Yeah, yeah, to go on that. It's a different, so like depending on, we spent our entire lives in person, right? <laughs> we spent our entire lives at, like 
and the entire evolution of mankind, uh, of humankind, uh, has been uh, building through communication, through micro expressions, uh, breath and like being able to read someone uh, in a nanosecond. Uh, and now we put it online, we, we made the box this small and uh, we, we put it on a delay. Uh, so yeah, there's gonna be tons of problems. I think people who move online and don't like it online isn't, is 100% fair because you like, and it's exhausting too. Like I remember when I first started playing online, I was exhausted. And mm -hmm. like certain things are heightened and certain things are lowered and I'm trying to get information constantly. Uh, the way you talk is different. The way you read people is different. Always be checking in, always be looking. Uh, yep. And it's so easy for, and on top of that, you have to be more aware of yourself and be zeroed in because it's so easy to check out. Cause remember we're alone in a room. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's so like literally just talking to ourselves, you know, just, yeah. I get the, grumpy the two, way faster. Yeah. Online. Uh, the two the two specific um, tips that I would have, I think, or, or pieces of experience that I've kind of gotten from um, my recent, you know, taking of like two two weekly games online, is one I really like having a text channel for crosstalk and table talk to just go Ooh, into. That's um, a good idea. So like this is something that we've done on Discord is that we'll get in the text we'll get in a, a conversation, we'll start the video call and the video call is the game. Um, and it's, it's not always in character, but it's pretty much always on topic because we're always trying to like not talk over each other and we're trying to stay focused. And we, you know, if we didn't, we would never get anything done. So right. we, the, the video chat, the voice chat, that's on topic. But if you want to joke about how dumb an NPC is, if you want to pull up a meme about how ridiculous something is, do that, um, but drop it in the text chat. Um, and what I have found personally is that when I'm running the game, um, which is kind of another interesting note, but when I'm running the game, I like to put the video full screen um, and just so I can just see all the players and I just won't even see the text chat and like the players will entertain themselves and they'll be off topic and they'll make ridiculous jokes like they normally do, but it never lures me in and kind of disrupts the, mm. the flow of the game. So the game continues, um, but the players still have that element. And then afterward, when we're taking a break, I'll look at it and just laugh again at all the memes that popped up. Um, so there's that. And then I've definitely found myself um, checking in with the other players a lot more of like, hey, how you doing? You haven't been in the scene for a little bit. I mean, what do you want to do? And I think that's maybe a function of the fact that, you know, L5R or the games that I'm playing are very non groupy Like they're not party adventures. Like D&D is a party adventure. Usually you're kind of tromping along as a party. They're, you know, the splitting the party is a, a thing that everybody jokes about and tells you not to do. But in Vampire and L5R, it's constantly like, well, I've got my secrets. I got to go talk to my boss for 10 minutes, um, you know, which can make for a rough environment online if you have to sit there in your own private room while everybody else goes off and does their thing. So I've tried to over communicate and check in with people because we don't have those kind of micro signals that Carlos was talking about. Uh -huh. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, other than over communicating um, or, tr you know, trying to stay on topic, not cross talking. Um, have you found that the social behavior or engagement of an online game is fundamentally different from an in-person game? Because if it's not, I mean, that's that's a good sign. Right. Uh, building in a designated break time. Mm -hmm. in, in a, I don't do that in in regular table type games, but I always do it in online games. How come? Uh, because when you're at a table, people can kind of wander away depending on whether or not they're in the scene or not. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe they go out and have a cigarette, whatever their thing is. Uh, and you can't do that online because you got to be paying attention all the time. There's not, you know, you don't know when you're going to be back. Yeah. And there's also, it also feels like, um, uh, I don't know why it's a little bit different with online and in person, like when you had mentioned like, oh, you just get up and go get like a soda and blah, 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 you'll be back. When someone does that online, I don't know why it feels like, oh, I should do that now too. 
or else I won't have an opportunity. Even though it's the same opportunity that you have in person, yep. for whatever yep. reason, it just feels like you're, maybe it's that movie mentality, right? Like where, where you sit down to watch a movie, I guess I have to pause the movie. You know what I mean? Like, like you behave differently when you watch a movie in a theater than when you watch a movie at home, yeah. you know? So, it's, it's, so uh, online, when one of us breaks, all of us breaks and we yeah. put a set time limit on it basically. That sounds right. Yeah, I think our group has just used that um, off-topic channel to just be like, "Hey, um, I'm not in the scene. I'm going to go take a smoke. I'll be right back." Um, and then people just kind of step away. So, like, it it, it was interesting because you know when you say you have to build it in for online games, but not physical games. You know, my first question was was why? Because it it didn't even occur to me. And it seems like my group has kind of found a different solution um, mm -hmm. than yours has, which is also probably worth noting that like we all found different solutions on how we wanted to play in person. You know, I know some tables are a, if you're sitting at the table, you're in character. And I know plenty of tables that are absolutely not that. So there's going to be similar expectations or mores that come with playing online. And that's entirely expected and okay. Yeah. There's no right or wrong ways. It's well, I guess the right way is the most is how you enjoy it. It's the right? way that Are works. you having fun? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the way because it's only going to work one way. Uh, and and my definition of works is people are happy. Like that's mm -hmm. my only definition of works. Uh, if people aren't happy, they should go. Like not go, but like not like like get away from me. I just mean yeah. like you should be proud. <laughs> just like, set yourself like, on fire. <laughs> yeah, just like this is the way it works. Uh, you know and different people play differently. Like I know I play differently when I'm on stream. Like I play way different than when I'm on stream than when I'm just like home and I know no one's watching me. <laughs> like, uh, and not in a bad way. It's just like, I'm just hyper-focused when I'm on stream. You know, I want to mm -hmm. be entertaining and show people. Um, yep. But yeah. Well, that's also, again, you know, I think with the, with the rise of streaming RPGs, um, which has surprised many, many people. Um, but thank God it I, happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that a lot of people started talking about how it was important to remember that their in-person games were not going to be the same as a stream game. Uh, and I think that may be something that's even more worth reminding people with regards to playing online is that it, because how it looks to you is going to be so much more like the stream game. Um, even if you are all little boxes on a screen, that doesn't mean that if you're not pulling off critical role level of excitement, that the game was still a failure. Uh, if you hung out with your friends and you had fun, the game was still great. Like you still played an RPG. You don't have to match what other people are doing. Yeah. I mean, that bar is super high too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, uh, like, but why aren't wife... you good as a professional voice actor? <laughs> yeah. Like my <laughs> wife, my wife is the community manager for critical role. And like, mm -hmm. she will even say like, they are professional sport storytellers, voice actors. Uh, they're mm -hmm. really good friends. It's like across the board, they check every single box and it's just like, yeah, that's why, you know what I mean? Like, that's why. It, it, you know i thought you said that's fly. white the first time i'm sorry <laughs> no, i apologize no, for that. no like that's superman can fly that's why superman <laughs> superman you know what i mean like yep. you just you just lift your weights and get stronger uh -huh. <laughs> so um we have maybe like 12 minutes or so left um uh, are there any other kind of general tips that you want to share with folks? Um, anything else that you've learned that kind of doesn't fall into one of the buckets that we've talked through yet? Um, checking in, I think checking in with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, yep. There is, uh, I think people are very nice. Uh, your friends are very nice. And like, again, those micro expressions you might not be picking up on. Uh, so you know, there might be things where people have a problem or people thought like, this is weird. Uh, again, this is the other thing too, you have to be aware of that people don't, people don't think of. We're all making eye contact at the same time. Like that doesn't happen in a, in, at your table, at your table, you're looking at someone and they're looking at someone else. And then the person on the right is looking at the person on the left and they're all moving around. But like and somebody's looking at their phone. And someone's looking at their phone, you know what I mean? <laughs> but at, at the same time, like 
we're all missing stuff and picking stuff up and picking and choosing constantly. And this game is different because we are all having a steering contest at the same time. And that could be exhausting because like, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you and we're all checking in and I am gathering information from like all five of my teammates all at the same time. Um, so be kind and there are things that you're going to miss. So like at the end, like check in in the beginning, check in the middle and check in at the end and just like give people an out because they're so nice. That's what I found. Like I've played with people who are, who thought it was a good idea. They thought like, you know, they've been looking forward to game night and they thought it was a good idea, but they're exhausted. Like even now people are like super exhausted, you know, and they might uh -huh. check in and then be like, well, I guess there's two more hours and I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is sit here. It's like, you have to sit here and stare at someone and, and engage to, and engage yeah. and like put on a show so it's just like check in be like hey if you want to dip go ahead and dip like that's cool but yeah yeah i, I did have to cancel a game the other week that i was running online because i was like i i've spent a whole week making decisions at work uh i can't spend this evening also making decisions like i need to just go and not have to think for a little bit so sorry folks but we'll come back and that's okay. Yeah. What about you, Christian? Uh, any other tips that you want to give? I've got a couple questions, but I want to see if anything that you, uh, for uh, me, you I think if you're if you're doing it for the first time and your whole group is doing it for the first time, start with a smaller group. Ooh, that's mm -hmm. a good tip. Uh, really just good. to start off with, because you know, running your normal six-player campaign uh, when you're GMing on uh, on you know on Roll Twenty or Fantasy Grounds for the first time, and you've just picked up the program and you've only been playing with it for five days even though it was five full 24 hour periods, you still don't know enough about the program to run a lot of players. Keep it small to start. That's a good idea. Yeah. Herding cats, right? You, you mm -hmm. don't want to put, <laughs> imagine putting all your cats online at one time and you have to take care of them. You have to keep them in front of a webcam. That's how you should think of it. Yeah. Like, uh, I definitely feel that playing games online has kind of cemented my feeling that four players is really about ideal for me. Um, especially mm -hmm. online. Uh, one GM and four players, I think, is enough to have a conversation continually going without risking too much crosstalk. When you get to five or six or seven or eight, like we a lot of times have for DD games, I think you need to start, you know, doing things that almost kind of feel silly, like raising your hand when you want to talk or, you know, just really trying to intentionally give people space to work through their stuff before it gets to your turn, basically. I agree with that too. Uh, and I've thought about that too. Like I, I believe five players, like one GM, four players, like that's the best one, the, the best way to go, especially because like split the party is going to happen. Like your party's going to mm -hmm. split. And then that feels like if it's a two and two, then it's equal share. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a, a one and three, then one person's getting the spotlight, which is always great to like mix mm -hmm. it up that way. And then those three could always split uh, can have time too. So yeah, I, I think, you know, and not to say anything bad about, you know, more players but you know oh no I, not I, at all it's just it's a yeah. it's a little easier to run small when you're first starting on a virtual yeah. tabletop for sure mm -hmm. so i think uh the other two questions or tips that i had um as maybe we're rounding out is one um i strongly recommend that if you are going to start an online game or make a transition to an online game consider scheduling another like quote unquote session zero just for the tech um, cause a lot of times, mm. I mean, not everybody does this, but I yeah, really, yeah. really like shared character creation, um, and shared world creation. I like doing a session zero where we all talk about what are our expectations of this game, who's going to play what, how are we going to interact? Let's build our characters together. Maybe we're related. What's our connection? That's what is the good world? storytelling, bud? Yeah. That's, that's what yeah. you're supposed like, to do. Yeah. And that's all session zero stuff. You know, it's, I think veteran players are used to that. New players sometimes uh, are not used to that trope. But if you're not used to playing games online, I think doing a, a technological session zero is a really good idea. So when I took my game with kids online, you know, I said, hey, we usually only play for two hours. We're going to meet for two hours. If we play, fantastic. I'm not expecting that to happen. All we're going to do is just kind of hang out and then get his webcam and audio working. Great. Now we're going to get his webcam and audio working. Great. So we're just going to kind of walk through the process and get comfortable with the tools and we'll expect to be focused next time. Um, I think something like that can be really important. That's that's really good advice. Um, when I so I run Roll Twenty tw Roll Twenties Roll Twenty Con, uh, their online <laughs> convention of gaming. Uh, so I'll organize that, and I have it built in 
uh, to our guests and our players that come on uh, an entire document on testing equipment. And I'm not talking about just like some people are new to streaming or, or doing those those types of things, uh, but some people aren't, some people have. Uh, and I still find it useful. Like everyone has, you know, cause it only takes one little problem to be a problem. And then you add that all up across an entire convention. And it's just like, okay, well now we're 20 minutes late. Now we're 30 minutes mm -hmm. late. And you have to understand like, yeah, people put like, it's the real world. People put aside time and stuff like that. So like, yeah, if we're going to start at seven, let's start at seven. It's just like, now we're trying to figure out, now we're looking up Reddit uh, articles on how to fix a webcam driver and like stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's like really a good. checklist. Yeah. Like I, I send a, I send that's a checklist a on idea. what, on what everyone needs to check before a convention. Like I that say, like, hey, yeah, check this, the Zoom link, make sure your webcam's connected, make sure your audio's mm -hmm. working, that they can hear. Like, I want to know a full test before anything goes on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd take that. Great. Um, the other question that I had is, do you feel that it's different or the social dynamics are different or the challenges are different in starting a game online versus taking a game that was physical and bringing it online? And if someone were asking you for advice or one or the other, would is there anything that you would tell them to do differently? Hmm. I mean, for me, no, they're, they're the same. Yeah, they're pretty much the same. I would just say that awareness, be aware mm -hmm. of your of what you're putting out there. So like I have, you know, like a resting angry face, you know, when I'm concentrating, <laughs> like I have like a triangle on my forehead and it just looks, I'm pissed off all the time. I didn't even know this until like my thirties when my mm -hmm. girlfriend was just like, I'm pretty I'm like, sure your lighting took care of it though. Carlos, so. <laughs> like like I, I didn't even notice that I, we were walking down the street one time and there was this like big tough guy or whatever. And like, he, he did like one of those head nods to me. And I'm like, isn't it strange how everyone always gives me all the mean tough guys always give me head nods. And she's like, you look like you're angry all the time. I'm like, really? I'm like, I have no idea. I think I'm a happy person. Uh, so be aware of like what you're putting out there because they're not picking up on all the stuff that they would in person mm -hmm. uh, and know that it's gonna, it, listen, I'm a tough guy. You're a tough guy. We all think we're tough guys, right? But you're gonna yeah. get exhausted and you're gonna get mm -hmm. tired a little bit more easily, even though you're in the comfort of your own home or wherever, uh, even though you're not traveling and finding parking or whatever, uh, you're still gonna get tired. I would say that mm -hmm. you're gonna get tired quicker uh, over a virtual tabletop game than you would in person. I think that kind of ties into something that was bubbling in the back of my mind of how the energy of an online game is different than the energy of an in-person game. And I find that when I'm running an online game, I kind of need to, to more often just be like, give me a moment to think about that. Um, where I don't tend to do that at the table. Um, and I, it occurs to me that I think that that's because at the table you more naturally are kind of feeding off the energy of the other players who are kind of in your immediate vicinity and you lack that um, for a virtual game. And I, I kind of wonder if maybe that's why you feel tired. Um, well, you know, you're, you're still sitting, but you're, sure. you don't have that feedback loop that's kind of powering you through the game. But let's say you come into the game tired, right? Let's say you've had a long day, you're coming into the game tired. Uh, everyone else is excited to play that that room and that energy in the room mm -hmm. automatically brings you up a little bit like you were feeling down in the dumps you were ready to take a nap but now you can get yeah. through a three-hour session no problem you put all those same people in different rooms and the one who's tired is still tired yeah mm -hmm. that's true that, that that is true because i know what it's like to be tired cranky and sleepy in this room but I wouldn't do it at my friend Kevin's house. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be sleeping. You have a friend here. named Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do it in his kitchen. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not going to do that to him or whatever. And that could just be me, but I, I feel like you would naturally, you know, you're on your own natural state. Like you're, you're, you're probably more free here and more open mm -hmm. to being yourself when you're at home. So yeah, I, yeah. So the other question, um, last question probably, because we are um, just oh, yeah. at 4.30. Um, question in chat was, um, are there any sites where people can help find new players for online games? So, you know, this is probably less of taking your existing game online and more... Finding people to play with. 
yeah, yeah. Like I'm not able to play with my, my existing group online. I need to find a new group. Um, where do you go to find players? There are so many, uh, there are so many groups like this on discord, mm -hmm. tons and tons and tons of them. Just, I mean, look them up. Yeah. They're everywhere. Yeah. I'm going to drop a link. Uh, roll 20 has the fine games to join, uh, for, okay. uh, I'm just going to drop it in there, uh, for anyone asking people put up games. You can kind of like look it up and down. It's kind of like, uh, um, I don't know, just like checking in and checking out. So you can like scope out the people, scope out the GMs, awesome. see what the, you know, what they've done before. And then like all different types of ranges and people are specific, right? Like they're, they're like, Hey, this is a tech that I'm, I play tactical D and D. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we're going to, we're going to number crunch in here. Uh, and then some people are like, this is just role play. We're just going to have fun. Uh, yeah. And then you could, uh, what else is cool about it? It's just like, I got this. Some guys like I got this book. And I want to play this book. And that might be mm -hmm. the same book that you want, that you're interested in buying or whatever. So, you mm -hmm. know, just jump in a game with this person. They'll be happy to play. Maybe you make a new friend. I don't know. So Thanks, I, Carlos, like, I guess great. my advice for that would kind of be twofold. One, if you have a virtual play platform you're familiar with, go to that social kind of forum for that platform. If you're on Roll20, go to here, go to the forums in Roll20. There'll be people talking about games. If you're looking for a specific game, but you don't have a platform yet uh, or both, um, go to where the community for that game already is, whether that's yeah. on the publisher site, their forums, on um, their, their Discord server or Reddit or anything like that. You know, I constantly see threads on Reddit, for example, for, you know, I wanna play a vampire game online. I wanna play cult online. You know, I wanna play this other weird niche game online. Who wants to play with me? Um, and sometimes you got to hunt for a little bit, depending on how narrow your interest is. But if you yeah. kind of keep poking around the places where the people who are interested in the thing you want to play are, you'll get a group together. And that's the thing, too. Like, obviously, Roll20 is system agnostic, too. So mm -hmm. if you have a game, even if you have your own game, right? If mm -hmm. you're like, how do I play my own game online? you can make Roll20 work for you in that way. You can come up with your own macros, your own cards, your own way to roll dice, your own character sheets even. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even people that like, they're like coders that like come up and they say like, I'll code your sheet for you uh, and mm -hmm. get it in Roll20. So it's just like, that's something that like, I know D and D is kind of like a go-to for everyone, but like for new games, for smaller games, uh, like, yeah, that's pretty Great. One of the biggest places. Yeah. Well, we got to wrap up. Um, Christian yeah. has to go to another appointment. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to thank I got to go play D&D &D online. Yep. <laughs> so I wanted to thank both of you for joining us. Um, anything else that either you want to say about your work or point anybody to stuff that you're working on right now? Do you want to tell us what you're going to go play, Christian? I'm going to go play D&D &D on, uh, on the Zombie Orpheus live channel uh, with a couple of friends from Metaverse. And, you know, I think we're just awesome. going to hang out, have our Friday night hangout. Pick up where we left off last week. See if we can get Great. anybody else to play, maybe. How about you, Carlos? Yeah, you can find me on all social media under Carlos Critz. Uh, you could also find me tonight on my Twitch channel, uh, twitch.tv backslash Carlos Critz. I'm going to be going through uh, Adobe Premiere. I'm teaching a lot of different tutorials for uh, content creation. So like the Adobe suite, like After Effects and Photoshop, Illustrator, stuff like that. But also camera equipment, photography, filming, cinematography as well. Cool. Uh, thanks again to both of you for joining us. Um, hopefully we can have you back when we eventually loop back around to this topic, because I imagine that as we're going through the quarantine, there's always going to be some group of people who are new to playing games online. So we might revisit some of these down the road and try to give people more advice. Uh, remember to, to check out all the other shows that we have on our channel. Mondays at 6 p.m. We had board games with the Brothers Murph. Uh, Wednesdays at 9 a.m. The Brothers Murph are back again to paint minis. This game gets dicey is at 11 a.m. And that is a lady in L.A. and a gentleman in London who play board games online together. So if you're trying to figure out how to play board games online uh, and you want uh, to see it in action, you should check that show out. Wednesday at 4 p.m. Uh, all these times are Pacific, by the way. I probably should have noted. Uh, Wednesday at 4 p.m. we have Fireside, which is Peter Atkinson talking with people kind of all throughout the gaming industry. Um, but his topic this season is the stories behind D&D 3rd Edition. So they talk with the people who were there during the acquisition of TSR and the development of the new edition to really talk about uh, and discuss how it felt, why they made some decisions, um, what they remember from the time. It's a really fascinating topic. 
6.30 p.m., we have the Westgate of Regulars, which is a group of local Seattle area authors who get together and play the game of D&D. And then Friday at 2 p.m., we have Table Takes, where we cover the week's news, Kickstarters, um, you know, any topics that we feel we want to dive into. And then at 3.30, we have a roundtable discussion, our Gen Conversations, where we try to you know, get some people together to talk through things that are important at this time. That's what this is, right? That is absolutely what this is. We have circled back around. I love it. Uh, so remember to follow our channel, um, turn on notifications to let us know, uh, to let you know when we go live. If you've missed anything, almost everything is up on YouTube or you can just look at the video on demand. Um, thanks again for watching. Uh, thank you to Christian and Carlos both for joining us. It was a pleasure talking with you. I hope you can join us again in the future.